Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ashley Thompson, and I'm Dan Novak. This program is designed for English learners, so we speak a little slower, and we use words and phrases, especially written for people learning English. Coming up on the program, Gregory Stockel has a story on a traditional dance in Southern Africa, and Brian Lynn brings us this week's technology report on things you can do to protect your Twitter account. Later, we present our American history series, "The Making of a Nation." But first, here is Gregory Stockel. Yule Wamkulu is a dance performed by unidentified men in Malawi, Mozambique, and Zambia. The group performs the dance at ceremonies to mark adulthood, among other important life events. They wear complex masks, makeup, and traditional clothing. The dance is seen as a way to connect with spirits of the dead. However. The group today is increasingly opening up to the public. Yule Wamkulu is rooted in the Chewa people of Southern Africa. Followers spread the dance to Zimbabwe in the early 1900s. It is hard to estimate how many Yule Wamkulu performers there are. The dancers belong to small, loosely connected groups. Yule Wamkulu was considered evil by Christian colonizers who attempted to ban the tradition. Notice Mazura organized a dance in an area of Zimbabwe's capital city called Mufakose. A group of people, including young children, came to get a closer look at the dance. In the past, even the adults would prefer to watch our dances from a distance. People were scared of us," said Mazura. In 2008, UNESCO included Yule Wamkulu on its list of intangible cultural heritage of humanity. It is a list of arts, ceremonies, and traditions found around the world that are passed from one generation to the next. The United Nations Agency describes Yule Wamkulu. As a secret society of initiated men, involved in a ritual dance dating to the 17th century. Over the years, some reports came out that damaged the image of Yule Wamkulu. There was a story about a young man who died during a ceremony. Another report said a man was severely attacked for breaking group rules. Yule Wamkulu in Zimbabwe is also threatened by people who falsely claim to be members of the group. These people carry out performances and falsely identify for criminal purposes. They are called copycats. Sometimes these copycat groups are violent. The problem is one of the main reasons for the public image campaign. Kennedy Kacharuka. Is the leader of the Zimbabwe Yule Wamkulu organization. We want people to respect us and not fear us, he said. We don't want to push them away, but we want to charm them. That is the only way they can appreciate who we really are. Kacharuka is also president of the Zimbabwe National Traditional Dancers Association. He described Yule Wamkulu as a ceremonial dance to connect with the dead. The dances are traditionally performed at funerals, weddings, and other events involving members. But the group has been doing more public performances in recent years, including performing with popular musicians. Members hope that the more people learn about the real Yule Wamkulu. The more easily they will recognize the copiers. Still, long-held views are difficult to change. These people are evil," said George Deza of Mufakose. He added, 
They move around with weapons and are violent criminals. There is still much mystery surrounding Yule Wamkulu. The identity of those who wear face coverings is kept secret. The religious centers where they prepare for performance is closed to non-members, and becoming a member involves secret activities. Kacharuka said they are trying to keep the rituals left to them by their fathers, and added the most important part is their secrets. Without them, we are nothing, he said. And he added, "It's not just a dance; it's a way of life. It's a culture and a religion." I'm Gregory Stockel. Twitter is in disorder. Elon Musk, its new owner, cut half of its workforce. Last week, hundreds more employees decided to leave the social media company. There are signs that their departure is affecting the system. Some users noticed problems receiving texts to sign in with two-step verification. Test pages are showing up. Some users are seeing more unwanted messages called spam. Others report receiving new replies to long removed tweets, and seeing drafts of saved tweets disappear. Twitter will not simply shut down overnight, but security experts warn that the severe job cuts may open the door to bad actors. They could look for weaknesses in the system and harm user accounts. Some people are considering leaving Twitter and moving on to other social media sites. Experts advise those who stay to take steps to protect their accounts. If you only use your login and password to sign into Twitter, it is important, especially now, to add an extra step to the process. The extra step to confirm your identity, called authentication, makes it more difficult for hackers to get into your account. Twitter has three methods to choose from: text message, an authentication app, or a security key. But some users have reported they are not receiving text messages to authenticate their accounts. Using an authentication app may be your best choice. This offers the most security. To do this, you will need to download an authentication app from the Apple or Android stores. Some examples include Google or Microsoft Authenticator, Authy, Duo Mobile, and One Password. Once you have downloaded the app. Open Twitter on your desktop computer and click on the icon showing ellipsis in a circle. There, select Settings and Privacy, then Security and Account Access, and finally Security. Next, you can select Authentication App and follow the instructions to set it up. Twitter may ask you to share your email address to do this. Once you are all set, you can use the auto-generated codes from your authentication app to add extra security when logging in to Twitter. Jane Manchun Wang is an independent software and security researcher in Hong Kong. She suggests removing permissions to third-party websites and apps through your Twitter account. That is because of possible security problems with Twitter's API or application programming interface. API lets third parties access Twitter data to create apps that work with Twitter. With fewer people working at Twitter, it will take longer for the service to fix security issues.
To turn off this feature, start in the Security and Account Access tool and go to Apps and Sessions. Here you should find all the third-party apps that are connected to your Twitter account. You might even find some from years ago that no longer exist. And you can remove access to each one. If you do not like the idea of losing years of your tweet history, you can download your Twitter archive if you would like to save them. It might take some time to download, though. This tool is only available on the desktop version of Twitter in the Your Account section of Settings. You will have to enter your password and authenticate again if you have that set up. When your archive is ready to download, you will get a notification on Twitter to download it on the desktop version of the site. While this process normally takes about 20 hours, it may take longer now. Some users have also reported having to try more than once. Some Twitter users are signing up for Mastodon, a previously little-known service that launched in 2016. Mastodon is a decentralized social network. That means it is not owned by a single company or billionaire. Instead, it is made up of a network of servers. Each server runs independently, but can connect so people on different servers can communicate. This is like how you can email people from your G or any Twitter list you might have to see if they also have Mastodon accounts. Many Twitter users have begun listing their other social networks as well as their names and other information on their Twitter pages. This will make it easy for people to stay in touch with them no matter what happens to Twitter. I'm Brian Lynn. You just heard Brian Lynn present this week's technology report. Brian joins me now to talk a little bit more about his story. Hi, Brian. Hello, Dan. Glad to be here. In today's report, we learned about issues some Twitter users have recently reported. The issues seem to be linked to changes, including major employee reductions, that have affected Twitter since Elon Musk took over the company. Brian, your report explores some steps Twitter users can take to keep their account safe during this period of intense change. What is one of the most important steps experts are suggesting? So one of the best things experts are suggesting is that users add multi-step authentication to their accounts. When activated, this process requires an extra step to confirm a user's identity. Doing this can add another level of safety that prevents internet attackers from hacking a user's account. I noticed one of the terms that appears in today's report also shows up often in other technology stories. It is authenticate. Can you expand a little on the meaning of this word? Sure, Dan. And you're right, I use this word quite often in the technology stories I write. A basic meaning for authenticate, used as a verb, is to prove that something is real, true, or what people say it is. So this process, known as authentication, which is the noun form, could relate to a digital action, such as a system confirming a user's identity on the Internet. But an expert could also confirm the authenticity, also used here as a noun, of other things, such as an old document discovered in modern times. Right. Well, thanks again, Brian, for joining me on the podcast and for sharing this information with our listeners. You're welcome. Thank you, Dan. From VOA Learning English, welcome to the Making of a Nation. I'm Steve Ember. 1852 was a presidential election year in the United States. The Democratic Party held its nominating convention in Baltimore, Maryland. 
The meeting opened in June of 1852. Delegates agreed that a man must win two-thirds of the convention's votes to be the Democratic candidate. On the first ballot, no one received two-thirds of the vote, so the voting continued. Finally, on the 47th ballot, support began to increase for someone considered an unlikely candidate. His name was Franklin Pierce. Pierce was from the northeastern state of New Hampshire. He was a lawyer and former state lawmaker. He also had served in the United States Senate and House of Representatives. He became an officer in the Army during the U.S. War with Mexico. On the 49th ballot, Pierce won the Democratic nomination. He would be the party's candidate for president. Pierce was a passionately loyal adherent of the Democratic Party and of its principles of negative governance uh, domestically and spread eagle expansionism in foreign affairs. Historian Michael Holt wrote a book about Franklin Pierce. Mr. Holt describes Pierce as someone who was like most Democrats at the time. In other words, he did not think the federal government should intervene much in efforts to help build up and develop the nation. But he wanted the United States to play a big and powerful role internationally. Naturally, Democrats did not agree on every policy issue. In 1852, the party was sharply divided on whether the government should or could permit slavery to continue in the United States. But Democrats decided to limit their fighting with each other during the election campaign, and they all agreed to support Pierce. The Whig Party held its presidential nominating convention in Baltimore two weeks after the Democrats met. The same thing that happened at the Democratic convention now happened at the Whig Convention. Delegates voted over and over again, but no man got enough votes to win. It took 53 ballots before one of the men, General Winfield Scott, won the nomination. On election day, Pierce won a crushing victory. The Democrats won not only the presidency, but also strong majorities in Congress. The Democrats' victory was so great that many people thought the Whig Party was finished. In fact, many Whigs themselves hoped their party was destroyed. Like the Democrats, Whigs disagreed with each other about slavery. Northern Whigs wanted to form a new anti-slavery party and Southern Whigs wanted to form a party that would better represent their interests. The Whigs lost badly in the 1852 elections because, unlike the Democrats, they were not able to bridge the differences between their Northern and Southern members. Franklin Pierce was 48 years old when he took office. He was the youngest man yet to be elected president. He was charming and made friends easily, but those who knew Pierce best worried about him. They knew that under all his friendly charm, he was a weak man. They feared the duties and problems of the presidency would be too great for him to deal with. Pierce also faced a difficult situation in his personal life. Two of his children had died when they were babies. A third child was killed in a train accident shortly before Pierce moved to the White House. In addition, his wife, Jane, did not like living in Washington, D.C., she did not support her husband's campaign for presidency. Years earlier, 
she had urged him to resign from the Senate and return to New Hampshire. She did not want to go back to Washington. When her husband was elected, she agreed to live there, but she rarely saw anyone. One of her close friends took her place at public events. Historian Michael Holt says Franklin Pierce's main goal as president was to keep his party united. One way to maintain party unity was to adopt popular democratic policies. He promised strong support for expanding the territory of the United States. He also promised a strong foreign policy. During his term in office, Pierce successfully negotiated with Britain to gain American fishing rights along the coast of Canada. He also supported diplomatic and trade talks with Japan. However, he was unsuccessful in an attempt to buy Cuba from Spain. National issues presented President Pierce with a more difficult problem. Now that the election was over, some Democrats felt it was time once again to raise the issue of slavery. The Compromise of 1850 had settled the question of slavery only in the Western territories. But anti-slavery activists said the Compromise should have done more to end slavery throughout the country. And pro-slavery activists said the agreement did not protect slave owners' rights. They did not want the federal government to intervene in slavery anywhere. As president in 1853, Pierce had to choose between the competing sides. He could support the Compromise of 1850 and say the dispute over slavery was settled. Or Pierce could try to make peace with both anti- and pro-slavery extremists. Giving the extremists jobs in his administration would be the easy way to satisfy their demands. And that was the policy Pierce chose. Contemporaries at the time predicted that this attempt to share the plums would wreck the party, and it did. Historian Michael Holt says Pierce sought to include men from competing sides of the Democratic Party in his cabinet. Pierce named William Marcy of New York as Secretary of State. Marcy wanted to limit the spread of slavery and keep the Union together. Jefferson Davis of Mississippi was named Secretary of War. Davis, more than any other man, represented Southern slave owners. He threatened to take the South out of the Union if the government set any limits on slavery. Caleb Cushing of Massachusetts was named Attorney General. Although a Northerner, Cushing was a friend of many Southerners. He was a very able man, but his loyalties were not clear. James Buchanan of Pennsylvania was named Minister to Britain. All these men had strong ideas about the future of the United States. President Pierce found it difficult to control them. One senator even said the administration should not have been called the Pierce administration because Pierce did not lead it. He said it was an administration of enemies of the Union who used the president's name and power for their own purposes. As president... Franklin Pierce faced another difficult question. Where should the United States build its new railroads? The country had expanded, and white settlers were moving west. 
Many were hungry for good transportation. They wanted railroads that reached across the continent from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean. Engineers decided that four new rail lines would be possible. They could cross the southern, central, or northern parts of the United States. Illinois Senator Stephen Douglas, a Democrat, proposed that three of the lines be built. He said the government could give land to the railroad companies. The companies could then sell the land to get the money they needed to build the lines. A Senate committee discussed the issue. Its members proposed that only one railroad line be built. But which one? Many congressmen believed a southern line would be best. There would be little snow in winter, and the railroad would cross lands that were already organized as states or official territories. A northern or central line would face severe winter weather, and it would have to cross a large, wild area called Nebraska. Nebraska was neither a state nor a territory. As a result, it did not yet have a local government that could support a railroad. In addition, many congressmen did not want Nebraska to develop a government. The reason, once again, was slavery. Michael Holt says members of President Pierce's party hoped the effort to organize Nebraska would unite Democrats once again. Instead, Mr. Holt says the Nebraska Territory caused more conflicts and ruined Pierce's administration. The bill increased divisions between Democrats and Whigs and between pro-slavery activists and anti-slavery abolitionists. And it brought the country one step closer to civil war. As one northerner wrote, it was said hundreds of years ago that a house divided against itself cannot stand. The truth of this saying is written on every page in history. It is likely that the history of our own country may offer fresh examples to teach this truth to future ages. And that's our program for today. Join us again tomorrow to keep learning English through stories from around the world. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Dan Novak. 